You're very warmly welcome. It's good to see you today, and we welcome you in the Savior's precious name. Those that have joined us on live stream, it's good that you've been able to join with us, and we pray that God will bless each of us as we worship Him together. So let's begin with this opening psalm, the psalm number 40. I waited for the Lord my God, and patiently did bear. At length to me He did incline my voice and cry to hear. Verses 1 to 5 of the psalm number 40. stand together.
We're now going to seek the Lord for prayer. As we come to pray today, uh, the missionary prayer calendar for today asks us to pray for the work teams who will travel and work on practical trips and youth mission trips in 2024. And we know there are some housing projects for new missionaries going out, and that's to be undertaken this year. So pray for that in particular. And as well as that, we come today with gratitude. This is St. Patrick's Day, and it's a day for just remembering and reflecting upon the gospel that first came to this island many, many years ago. And it's also, as a colleague said in a, a, a little group chat amongst ministers today, it's Free Presbyterian Day, because on this day the Free Presbyterian Church was founded in 1951. But of course, the gospel that we preach, thank God, is much older than that, and much more universal than one body. So we have a lot to be thankful for. So let's get before the Lord and let's seek His face together, and let's call upon His name. Our gracious Father, we come into Your holy presence in the name of our Savior. We thank You for Your mercies and Your goodness. We rejoice that Your mercies, they are new every morning, and great is Your faithfulness. And we thank you for a faithful God. And we have been reflecting upon the faithfulness of God as we have been singing this opening psalm. And we thank you that you have drawn us from that horrible pit and from that fearful clay. And you have set our feet upon a rock and established our way. We know that your blessings, they are more than can be set in number. We cannot enumerate them. We cannot begin to identify them all because they are so numerous. And we thank you for the benefits that you daily load and weigh us down with. We thank you for a, a God who is just, a God who is holy, a God who is powerful, but yet a God who condescends, a God who has humbled himself and sent his Son into this world in the form of a man that we might be saved through his life and through his death and through his resurrection. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and we praise you that you are ready to hear us, and you're full of mercy, and you're long-suffering, you're good and you're kind. And we thank you that all of these great blessings, they flow from you, and therefore we come to you today and we praise you. We praise you because you are the one from whom all blessings flow. Lord, we draw nigh into thy presence at this time, and we pray that you would receive of our thanksgiving for the gospel heritage that we have. We thank you for a man called Patrick who came to this island, who preached the gospel, who established churches, and a gospel heritage has remained despite the darkness that came in and encroached upon this island, yet the pure stream of gospel truth, the very glimmer of light that was never extinguished, and the stream never completely ran dry, and you never left yourself without a witness. And therefore, we come to you today, and we thank you we can look beyond all of the myths and all of the traditions and all of the culture that many associate with Patrick, and a lot of the nonsense too, and we can simply humbly thank you for a man sent by God and for others who have come and who have preached and who have prayed and who have witnessed and who have labored over the counties across this island. And we thank you that today we have the privilege and the liberty and the freedom to minister your word here in this part of Ulster. We thank you, Lord, for the establishment of our own denomination back in 1951. We thank you for those who established the work, who had a vision for the gospel, and we thank you that we have heard your word, and we have come to faith. We pray for those that have not come to faith today, those who do not know you, those who have not embraced the Savior as their Savior. We pray that you would work upon their hearts, even in thy house today, that they would come to know Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who cannot be with us, those who are in hospital, those who are in nursing homes, those who are in their own homes and are infirm and cannot get out, we pray that you would encourage them, that they would know your presence and know your grace to help, 
and know the love of the Lord to be surrounding them. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldest undertake for all those that are on our hearts today who are unwell. We pray that you would undertake for the Sunday school as they are taught the things of God. Bless the teachers, bless the students. Help them, Lord, to break forth the bread of life. We pray that you would uh, undertake for our young people. We thank you for keeping them safe on their weekend so far. And we pray that you would be with them this morning as they hear your word in Tandragee and then as they have lunch and make their way back home. We pray you would keep them safe. And we commit them to you. And the fellowship they've had, the word they've received, we pray it will fasten upon their hearts and be a blessing and a help to them. We pray that you would undertake for your word wherever it would go forth today. Bless the ministry of the truth of God. We pray that you be with us now as we continue to worship you. And we pray, O oh God, that our worship would be in spirit and in truth. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's now turn in the Word of God. We'll continue our readings through the book of Romans. We're turning today to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, we're only going to read the verses 1 through to 7 of this chapter. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even as Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us, to the glory of God. Amen. We know that God will bless the reading of His Word to our hearts. Paul is still dealing with this subject of division amongst Christians. Division not because of doctrine or theology. Division not because of what we call the crucial fundamentals of the gospel, division not because of backsliding or apostasy, but division, but division because of preferences, because one person preferred something more than another or preferred one practice, and God's people were falling about, or were falling out over that, and, 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 and things never change. Uh, as people, we are sometimes inclined to uh, disagree, and not only disagree, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing, but when you allow that disagreement to become a real division, that, that's where the problem is. And Paul's dealing with this matter, and here in Romans 15, verses 1 through to 7, he sets down the means whereby needless division is healed. He sets it down. And in the verse 3, he, he really sums it all up. For even as Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. A selfless spirit. Very often, at the root of all of our problems is pride. Pride can be an incredibly stubborn thing. One person thinks they're right and always right, and everyone else on a certain issue has to be wrong. That can be a very dangerous thing. And we are told here that Christ pleased not himself. And of course, Christ was right in everything, absolutely right. But he had a 
selfless spirit. What he did was not for himself. What he did was for God's glory, and what he did was for us, for our salvation. And you think of what Christ endured in life. You think of the accusations that were hurled against him. You think of the reproaches that he experienced. You think of the the hatred and the vilification he took. And yet, he went as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And so Christ is our great example. But what is this selfless spirit? What does it look like? Well, Paul gives us some words here, some phrases that teach us what a selfless spirit really is. If you look at verse 5, Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. So, we need to be conformed to Christ. We need to be like Him. And we need patience. Patience sometimes to bear with one another. And this patience comes from God. It's not something that comes naturally to the sinful heart of man the God of patience and consolation. And the God of patience and consolation can give us one mind and one mouth. This is what Paul was saying to the Romans. He said, you need one mind and one mouth. And you need to be together, focusing upon the great mission that you have in the city of Rome. Rather than falling out about needless things and making controversies where there should not be controversy. You need to have one mind and one mouth glorifying God because needless division does not glorify God. Therefore, he said in verse 7, and this is how he sums it up, wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Receive one another as Christ has received us. And that is the cure, and that is the antidote for needless division. I was taking the lecture on Friday night about the history of Christianity in Ireland, and I was telling the folks there at the lecture a story that was sad but also quite humorous there were a group of Presbyterians in Ulster and in Scotland who were known as succeeders. They succeeded from the older Presbyterian body, and they did it for very good reasons. There was a watering down of the gospel, and there was false doctrine were creeping into those old bodies, and therefore the succeeders took a separate stand. But the succeeders were only five years in whenever they also divided over really a political matter in Scotland, and the people in Ireland had to take sides. And so, the succeeders, they divided between what was known as the burghers and the anti-burghers. The burghers were a, a political form of government in Scotland. But there was a, a minister in Scotland, and he was married to a lady called Alison. Her name before she was married was Alison Erskine. Now, her family were very prominent in the succession movement, and her her brothers were part of the original succession. But her husband came home, and and he was a, a burgher, and he had faced the synod, and the synod had put a number of men out, for they were anti burgers And some of the men they put out were her brothers. And he came home and he he said to his wife, we have just excommunicated some of your family. And she looked at him and she said, well, she says, I will be your wife, but you will not be my minister. And so from that day, she began to worship at another church, and she walked 10 miles, I think, to get to that other church. But the story doesn't quite end there, because here in Ulster, those two bodies, they preached the same gospel, they represented the same truth, and they established churches, and God was blessing them. 
But 60 years later, they realized this isn't worth fighting over. And so they came together. I think there's a lesson there. Sometimes we can look for enemies in the wrong places. And that is something that the Apostle Paul is teaching us here as well. Uh, let's sing another hymn, and we will sing this hymn 192. O word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky, we praise thee for the radiance that from the hallowed page a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. We'll stand together. to see you, and you're, you're warmly welcome, as I said. Uh, so let's have the necessary announcements for the, the incoming week. Now, today, of course, is St. Patrick's Day, uh, so tonight I'm going to reflect upon the, the ministry of St. Patrick. I want particularly to look at the missionary spirit of St. Patrick's Church. Uh, last year, at this time of the year, I, I did a talk on Anna Long, and the Reverend Horace, former chairman of our mission board, member of our mission board, a missionary himself, of course, to Kenya at one time. And he said to me, this church of Patrick struck him that it was a real missionary church. And, and it's all there. The missionary spirit is all there. And I think there's great lessons for us to learn from the missionary spirit of these early Christians. So we're going to reflect upon that tonight. So I encourage you to come along to the Lord's house this evening at seven o'clock. The, 
this is Building Fund Sunday, so please uh, remember that. And then on Wednesday evening, the uh, Bible study and prayer meeting, the Bible club, and then Thursday, the, the Bible club. So do please remember these various meetings, Youth Fellowship on, on Friday night as well. And then next Sunday in the morning, we are going to be uh, presenting the report for the financial report for, for last year, and then the, the, the general report of the whole year's activities. That, that'll be published probably on, on Saturday, and, and, and you'll get a digital copy of that, but there'll be some hard copies of that as well uh, for distribution next Sunday. So that will be happening in, in, in the morning. And then in the evening time, we're having our Winter Bible Club's Parents' Night. And there'll be supper afterwards. The ladies, please help with that. That would be appreciated. Uh, the children will be taking part, and they'll be singing and reciting the memory verse that they've been learning. And the children of Claremore and the, the Church Bible Club will all be coming together. And of course, they, they, they never really get together until that night. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that and having the parents along. Our sister Joyce Walsh will be bringing the special children's address. Do please remember that. Get along to that special meeting next Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. And then on uh, Monday the 25th, we'll be having our, our fellowship, uh, our lunchtime fellowship. So do please remember that and plan to get along those that are free and available on Monday the 25th at, at midday. And do remember all the various prayer requests as well. Keep them, please, before uh, the Lord. We're greatly saddened this week to learn of the, the passing of Colin Hart, co-founder of the, the Christian Institute. The Christian Institute has, has been going for about 30 years. What an amazing work they have done to defend Christian liberties and also to provide very many resources for uh, churches on all of the ethical issues that we're faced with these days. And I think one of the things that is a tremendous tribute, just one story that's a tribute to the work of the Institute, is that all of the cases they've ever took to defend street preachers, people preaching on the streets who have been arrested by the police wrongfully, every case they have ever taken on, they've never lost one case. And, and that, that's a great tribute to the work. And of course, all of that has taken a tremendous amount of resource and manpower. And our brother Colin was at the heart of all of that. But the Lord chose to take him home into his presence. So it's a big challenge for the Christian Institute to do please pray for them as they would plot the course ahead without someone who was very much uh, their leader. And he, of course, was their director. So please keep that in your prayers, please. And all the others that are laid aside that we have been remembering in our prayers over this past time. Let's now have the hymn 695 as the children of the Sunday school come in. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. Let's stand together.
Please turn in your scriptures to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. On Friday evening, the historical committee of our presbytery published this book. It contains the contents of the first annual lecture last year uh, that the Reverend David Linden uh, conducted on the Covenanters, and he focused particularly upon the Irish Covenanters, the Covenanters here in Ulster. And uh, there's some poems in here. It's very well illustrated. There's some good photos and pictures, and as well as that, the Reverend Gregory McCammon has given little sketches, little brief sketches of some of the Ulster Scots ministers who came here in the 17th century. Um, it's a very nice little booklet, priced at five pounds. Um, they're sitting on the table. If you want to take one, you can take one, but write your name in the list, and you can see our brother Robert Gillespie and pay at some other stage. Let's turn to First Samuel chapter 3. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered and called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Amen. We know that God will add his own blessing to the reading of his inspired and infallible word. Let's seek the Lord for prayer. O God, our Father, we come to you. We thank you for the Word of God. As we consider your truth today, and particularly think of the life of Samuel, that you would touch our hearts, that we would be challenged by this child who was destined to become one of the greatest men in all of Bible history. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, would be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen and amen. Today we're going to think about Samuel the seer. The word seer was an old word for the prophet, for the man of God, and Samuel is referred to as the seer. Samuel's name really refers to the God that hears. God hears. Hannah asked the Lord for a son, and the Lord gave her a son. God heard her prayer. And that really sums up Samuel's life, because he was a man who had a very unique and a special relationship with God. And that relationship with God began here in 1 Samuel 3, the passage that we have read together. And how often is it not whenever we think of Samuel, we think of the child? It was Joshua Reynolds who painted that portrait, the little Samuel in prayer. 
And so often that's how we see Samuel. He is the child, the child who was given by his mother, the child who labored in the tabernacle, the child whom God spoke to, the child whom God called, the child who misplaced the call of God for the call of Eli. And he had to be directed to submit his heart to the Lord. Whenever we think of Samuel, we often think of the child, the child who was in prayer. And yet that obscures the fact that Samuel was indeed one of the greatest men. This child would become one of the greatest men in all of the history of Israel, in all of the history of God's Word. Samuel was the last of the judges. He was the last to rule and govern the people during what we call the theocracy. The theocracy was whenever God ruled the people personally, not through a king, not through a settled government, but through giving his word to individuals that he raised up. And these individuals were not raised up according to the hereditary principle. They were raised up by God for a specific purpose at a specific time. The book of Judges contains the lives of these men who were known as the judges, and Deborah, the one lady who was also a judge. But now we come to Samuel, who was the last of the judges and the greatest of the judges. Because the days of the judges were dark times, days of detention, days of departure from God, days of apostasy, when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But in the midst of these days, God in providence raised up this child, a child that was born quietly and silently in an obscure family. And yet the child was born so dramatically as the story of Hannah indicates because God had a great purpose and a great destiny for this child. This was the darkest time for Israel as a nation. Eli, who was the judge before Samuel, had spent 40 years ruling over the people. He was also the priest of God who served in the tabernacle. And Eli, old Eli, had lost his way. His eyes had become dim, but his spiritual vision also had become dim. His sons were using spiritual office for their own gain and also to indulge and to gratify their own sexual desires. Israel was on a collision course with God's judgment, and God's judgment would come, and the ark would be taken. And Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, would die, and the Philistines would gain a new dominance over the people. In the midst of these times, these terrible times, these dark times, God raised up this child. Whenever we think of Samuel, we think of the child. The child who became the great judge. The child who would oversee the transition of the kingdom from theocracy to monarchy. The child who would unite Israel in a way that Israel had not been united since the days of Joshua, who would lay the basis for Israel as a nation, a basis that would continue right up to the Babylonian exile. Israel owed a lot to Samuel, more than they realized in his day and generation. Samuel is right up there, along with Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, along with David and some of the greatest kings. He's right up there with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, the great prophets. When we look at Samuel, we look at a man that we could spend weeks studying, and perhaps sometime we might. But for now, we're going to look at a story with one message. Let us first of all think about his suckering. God would bless the people through this child because of the love and the devotion of a mother's heart. 
Whatever Samuel achieved, he achieved because of his mother. His mother, Hannah, was a heartbroken lady living in a polygamous marriage with her husband's second wife who had children and who taunted her because she had no children. Husband who didn't really care. And she lived with this. And then there was that momentous day whenever she went up to Shiloh for the feast of the Lord. And she wept sore and prayed unto God. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 and the verse 10. And she promised that when the Lord would give her the child, he would be given to God. It was a mighty promise. Some people make vows and they don't pay them. It's a dangerous thing to make a vow and not to pay. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. For God will hold you accountable for that. But Hannah made a vow and she didn't forget her vow. When the Lord gave her this son, she called him Samuel because God heard. And there came that day when she returned to old Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and the verse 17, presenting the child. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent them to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Eli had misinterpreted Hannah. He thought she was a drunken woman weeping in the Lord's house. His vision, you see, was so dim. He did not see the spirituality. He could not deduce the fact that here was a woman broken before God. And how chastened he was when she returned with this child presenting him with the child. For this child, I prayed. Hannah realized something that no one else realized. That there was a potential in the child. And she raised him for those formative years until he was able to go alone to the tabernacle she raised him for a purpose, that he might be a man of God. And she wept over him. She prayed with him. She taught him God's word. And the word was never forgotten. The word remained in his heart. Everything that Samuel did, he did because of his mother. It's an encouragement for mothers. It's an encouragement for parents to pray over your children and to never give up, to see and to recognize their potential. We're living in dark days. But at some stage, we don't know when, God will raise up a child to be a mighty preacher of the word who will shake this country from top to bottom with the gospel. And who knows who that child will be? But God knows. We've got to realize the potential in the heart of a child. It was the most unlikely place that she brought him to. If Hannah had have known everything that was going on in that place, the sin, the debauchery, the wickedness, she would have trembled to have brought him. It was a terrible place to leave a child, even though it was the Lord's house. It was a place of deep and dark apostasy, but God would look after the child, and God would raise the child up from this place to be a great man. John Wesley grew up in a home. His father was a clergyman, but he was always in debt. And his father and mother, they disagreed over politics. Um, his father was a supporter of King William, Prince of Orange, and his mother was a supporter of King James. And yet his mother, Susanna, was a woman of unique spirituality. A woman who prayed over her children. One of her sons would become the great hymn writer. 
whose hymns we still sing, and another son would become the great preacher and organizer of early Methodism. And between them, they would see thousands of souls won for Christ. Oh, what God can do through a praying mother in the heart of a child, his succoring. Let's think about his salvation. Samuel was working and laboring away here in the tabernacle, doing menial tasks, cleaning, tidying, doing whatever the priest asked him to do, trimming the lamps perhaps, making sure that lamp was always lit, doing all of those jobs. But he did not know the Lord. Do you see that in verse 7? And Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. That's why he didn't recognize the call of God when it came. That's why he thought it was the call of Eli. It is a tribute to his faithfulness, to that heart that was taught to obey. And as soon as the voice came in the middle of the night, he went scurrying off to old Eli. You called, Master. Three times he got up and he went, You called, Master. Never a question. Never a complaint. But on this occasion, it was not Eli's voice. It was the voice of the Lord. And while he had been taught to obey the man, he had to be now taught to obey the Lord and to respond to the voice of the Lord. There is a strange symbolism in the verses 2 and 3 of 1 Samuel 3. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And there the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. For the ark of the God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. It was just like any other night. Samuel went down to sleep. But the lamp of God was just about to go out. Little did they know it, but a terrible darkness was coming upon the nation spiritually, a terrible darkness. Eli's eyes were waxed dim. Soon they would be shut forever in death. Samuel laid down to sleep, and then the Lord came. And he saved the child, and he gave the child a word. He called the child to be a great prophet in the land. It was all about the voice of God. As we come to the Lord's house, whose voice are we listening to? Do we come with a heart that wants to hear the word of God? Lord, speak to me. Whatever the word is, whatever you have to say to me, whatever sin you decide to trump on, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to respond to your voice. I'm going to be like this child and hear the word. you heard the voice of God today? And then we think about his seal. God sealed his ministry. Look at verses 19 to 21 of 1 Samuel 3. Something happened, Samuel, from this moment that God spoke to him. He grew, and the Lord was with him. And did did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba. They knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. This child became a prophet. He had an authority. But it wasn't the authority of the young man as he was developing. It was the authority of God. God put his authority and his seal and his favor upon Samuel. It was the authority of the Word of God. Do you see the emphasis upon the Word? God revealed himself to Samuel and Shiloh by the Word of the Lord. And Samuel preached and brought God's Word. He didn't preach his own words. He He brought the Word of God. None of His words, they fell to the ground. People listened and they were attentive because God was speaking through the young man. 
Then we come over to 1 Samuel chapter 7, and the verses 15 through to 17. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah, and judged Israel and all those places, and his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. And you get the sense of this man being as an itinerant preacher, as Patrick was here in Ireland, going from place to place, visiting the land, visiting the nation, judging the people, bringing them God's Word. He was able to tell the people what no one else could tell them. If you come over to 1 Samuel chapter 9, and the verse 9, we have the moment when Saul met Samuel, and Saul lost his donkeys. Some have said that was pretty symbolic of Saul's life, for he always seemed to be a man who was lost. We'll look at Saul next time. But verse 9 says, as he lost the donkeys, he went to inquire of the Lord's servant. Before time in Israel, verse 9, a man went to inquire of the Lord. Thus he spake, come and let us go to the seer, for he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, well said, come let us go. So they went on to the city where the man of God was. They went seeking out the man of God, and as they found the man of God, look at verse 27 of 1 Samuel 9. Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on, but stand thou still a while that I may show you the word of God. I've got a word from the Lord for you today. That was the authority. As we come to God's house, the authority is the book. Never forget that. Let's give the word respect. And let's hear what God will say. Let's also think about his supplications. He was a great man of prayer. The very fact that his name is so intertwined with the God who hears. He certainly was a, a great man of prayer. And we see that particularly in First Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7 is the moment whenever Samuel really comes into his own. The ark was taken by the Philistines. It was a terrible moment, a catastrophe. God judged the Philistines because they had taken the ark. The ark was returned to the men of Beth Shemesh, but the men of Beth Shemesh looked inside the ark. They shouldn't have done that. And they too were judged. And then they ark was taken by the men of kerjath Jerim, and it was brought to the house of Abinadab, chapter 7, verse 1. And we're told that as long as it was in kerjath Jerim, the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. There was a 20-year period here of spiritual dearth. The time was long. I tell you, when God's not blessing, when the days are barren, when the souls aren't being saved, these days in which we're living in, the time is long. But the people were lamenting after the Lord. They wanted the Lord to do a new thing. And then Samuel stepped forth. And Samuel taught them that the Lord would do a new thing. And we have the revival that took place at Ebenezer. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. But look particularly at verse 8, the first Samuel 7. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. The Philistines were in the ascendancy. Don't stop praying for us. He was recognized as a, a man of prayer. And the nation was saved. And the Philistines were defeated. And Samuel was consolidated as the judge because he was a man of prayer. And the tide of sin will only be turned in our nation 
when God's people start praying. Praying not just with words, but from the heart, crying for God to work. This land needs a people of prayer. And then let's also think about his subjection. Chapter 8 is a rather sad chapter, because Samuel had served the people and served the people well. Then the people, they came to Samuel and they said, give us a king. And Samuel was very displeased in verse 6, because he felt hard done by. He had hoped that his sons would follow him, and I think Samuel was in error where that was concerned. But he felt grieved. He felt let down. He felt unappreciated. He felt discouraged. But he did something in chapter 8, verse 6. He prayed unto the Lord. And verse 7 tells us that the Lord said, Hearken unto the voice of the people. Listen to them. They're going to have a king. And Samuel accepted what was God's will. And that is a great attribute. And there are times in life when things will go against us. And things will happen that we didn't plan and didn't intend. And we will feel insulted. And we will feel humiliated. And we will feel aggrieved. Perhaps with justification. But in those times we have to accept the God of sovereignty. And we take the matter to the Lord. Samuel teaches us that. But I also want you to think about his sorrows. Come with me over to chapter 15. The verses 10 and 11. Poor Saul, poor Saul. Saul just couldn't get it right. And of course, Saul himself was a judgment because the people wanted a king and they rejected Samuel. And rejecting Samuel, they rejected the Lord and the Lord let them have their heart's desire. He let them have Saul. And the word of the Lord came in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 15. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Samuel had felt in his heart it was not the right thing for the people to ask for a king. Neither it was. God allowed them to have the king. But whenever the king came, and the king did wrong, Samuel loved that king. He didn't for one moment think, well, I told you so. He cried unto the Lord all night because Saul had sinned. He was a sensitive soul, sensitive to sin and to what sin could do. And it hurt him to see another failing God And yet he had to turn his back on Saul because God turned his back on Saul. Now, it wasn't Samuel being hard. That was him doing what God wanted him to do. Times we have to do hard things, but we have to ensure that we're in the will of God. But at all times, we need a heart of compassion. Whatever sin we repudiate, we need a heart of compassion for the sinner. And we certainly should never treat those that have failed as if we hate them. That is a terrible crime. Samuel did not have that spirit. And let's also think about his sight in closing. Samuel, unlike Eli, his spiritual insight remained to the very end. He never lost sight of God and God's will and God's plan. And God called Samuel to go to Bethlehem, where our Lord would in a later time be born, and to the house of Jesse, and to search out for the new king. And of course, he found David. And what a beautiful picture it is. Samuel anointing David, the great type of Christ, with the oil. Samuel shows us the way to Christ. And so should we. We signpost to the Savior. 
But there's something else about Samuel, and with this I close in relation to his sight. There are lots of indications. We're not going to go into it now, but he nurtured the prophets. For the first time in the history of Israel, you read about more than one prophet. You read about prophets being gathered together. And we know that Samuel certainly nurtured David, and David himself became a great prophet. And there arose this great tradition in Israel of the schools of the prophets. Many were trained and skilled in the things of God. And in that, Samuel laid down a foundation for Israel's future. And others such as Elijah and Elisha, and others too, would walk in that tradition. In the Word of God. Patrick left behind him a legacy that we have today. And others have done that. And we should ensure that like Samuel, we leave behind a legacy of truth. We began by talking about the child. But Samuel was always the child. Even as the great judge, statesman, he was the child. He was always God's child, obedient to God, seeking out God's Word. And today... He's still the child of God. Before the throne of God above, reunited with his dear mother, Hannah, rejoicing in his Savior. And so shall we, if we too have heard the voice of God. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of Samuel. Give us such a ministry and give us such a heart and give us such a spirit. Write your word upon our hearts for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's sing another children's hymn in closing, and this will be the offering hymn, so keep your seats, please, while your tithes and offerings are received. Samuel shone, and Jesus bids us all shine with a clear, pure light, like a little candle burning in the night in this world of darkness. So we must shine, you in your small corner and I in mine. think of all of the work that needs to be done for new missionaries going out, that you would meet all of those needs and bless the teams that go out to serve you in order that God's Word might be taken to other lands. We pray, Father, that you would bless us today as we go our separate ways. Be with us as we return this evening to God's house. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our abiding portion now and evermore.
Amen.